Amen. Um, I want to go back to this to this song real quick, this cornerstone, and I want to look at a verse in here. And he says, "Weak made strong in the Savior's love." And, and just like with with John Newton, it, it goes with you and I that that a the requirement, one of the requirements for salvation to be saved is to realize that you're weak. That in and of yourself you're weak and you're incapable of doing the things necessary to live a, a life pleasing before God. Now the truth of the matter is that goes for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever walked on the face of the earth that they're incapable of doing what needs to be done to live a holy, righteous life before God. That's just the truth of the matter. One man, only one man was ever capable of that. And His name was Jesus. And it still is Jesus, amen, because He came to save us from our sins. But that's the truth of the matter. The first requisite is that we come to a place that we realize that we are weak. And that in and of ourselves, we're insufficient. We're incapable. Amen. Uh, Wednesday night, and I'm going to use Clayton for an example. He, he spoke something to me, and I'm... It's something, a place that I came to realize myself, and I hope you don't mind me using you, what you said as an example, because after service, he told me, he said, I'm just tired. I'm tired. I said, that's a good place, because that's where I was when I got saved. I was tired. I was just tired of being lost, tired of being undone, tired of being bound by the powers of sin without a seeming way out. I was sick and tired of being tired. That's another requisite for a person to get saved, is that they've got to be sin sick. They've got to be tired of being bound by sin. They've got to be tired of being destroyed. And the only way to realize that you're, that the only way to get tired of being sin sick is to realize, first of all, that you are sin sick. That you've got a disease. It's called sin that rules and reigns in your body and there's nothing that you can do about it except that you would give your heart and life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the requirement to get saved. But what I want to do today, I really felt like I wanted to go back. You know, living in South Louisiana, one of the things that we understand or we should understand is that there's not really a solid foundation around here. When you build something, it always seems to sink. Sooner or later, it sinks. And, and a lot of times, people have to come back and they have to do foundation repairs. Amen. But the good thing about this Christianity is we have a solid foundation. Amen. When the truth of the message of the cross is being, is being built and laid upon, the, the, the foundation is solid. Amen. But every now and then, you just got to come back and throw that foundation out there again. Every now and then you just got to go back to that foundation and look upon that foundation just to make sure that you're headed in the right direction, just to make sure that you're learning the right things. Because the truth of the matter is that a lot of people, they're on what seems to be a shaky foundation because they've never been set and built upon the true foundation of Christ and Him crucified. So what I want to do today, I want to do a little bit of a, a teaching or like Brother Larson would call it, treaching. Amen. Because any good teaching has some good preaching and any good preaching better have some good teaching so we're going to try to do some some preaching here today I want to go to the book of Galatians chapter 2 the New Testament book of Galatians chapter 2 written by the Apostle Paul to the church uh, to the to the area of Galatia I mean Galatia wasn't just one church um, but it was a region with several churches and the Galatians were being infiltrated um, by Judaizers and, and they were trying to bring in the law and they were beginning to be thrown off onto another foundation that foundation not solely being who Christ is and what he accomplished at Calvary's cross. Amen. In that song that we that we sang earlier, it talked about being found in the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. And that's the foundation of Christianity is understanding the righteousness by which you are accepted to God is not the righteousness that you in and of yourself have to offer up to God, but rather the righteousness that He has offered up to you. Do you understand that 
What makes you acceptable before God on a daily basis is not what you have to offer to God, but rather what it is that He's given to you so freely. And it's important that you understand that foundation every day as far as your daily living goes. Verse 11, the apostle would write, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Now, if you understand anything about Peter, you know who Peter is. Peter was an apostle. He was an original disciple, one of the twelve. He was around as far as Christ goes, way before the apostle Paul was around. Now, the Catholic Church, they claim that Peter was the first pope, which is, which is false. It's not true. It's not true at all. There had, there's no bearing to that whatsoever. If that was the case, number one, Paul would have not rebuked him to his face. Number two, it would have been Peter who would have set over the churches in Jerusalem and not James. That's a false, that's, that's false. Peter was never a pope. He was never the first pope and, and there's never been a pope that's been called by God. That's false. The papacy is false. That's, it's, it's false and it's antichrist. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stun him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Now you've got to understand that in this setting, James, he set over the council in Jerusalem. He was the, the Lord Jesus Christ's brother. At first he didn't believe, but he came to a place of belief eventually. He got saved, and he was one of the heads of the church in Jerusalem. Now... There was a lot of tension, you've got to understand, between the Apostle Paul and between James and the council. And if you go back to the book of Acts, you can see some of that tension was there because Paul was given a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that these men, they were beginning to understand, but they were not there yet. They were still holding on to a lot of the Jewish rites, a lot of the things, uh, the, the circumcision and the law and, and things like that. They didn't quite understand. And the Apostle Paul, what he's talking about here was some Judaizers that came from Jerusalem, some people that said, yeah, Christ is good, but then there's the law and there's this and there's that. And they begin to add upon the foundation of solely Christ and Him crucified. What you've got to understand is that when something begins to be added on the foundation of Christ, who He is and what He accomplished at Calvary's cross, no matter how good it seems, no matter how good that it looks, it is law and it is legalism and it will lead you down a road of bondage. It will bring you back into bondage to the power of sin. Do you understand that? You'll find yourself struggling with sin over and over again. And it will ultimately lead to your death, spiritually speaking. He said, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. In other words, he was eating with the Gentiles, which was against the Jewish laws. He was doing that when these people weren't around, but when they showed up, he started to move away. He wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He became two-faced. He became hypocritical in what he was doing. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Peter, in other words, if you're over here living like a Gentile, eating with Gentiles, eating the things that the Gentiles are eating, why is it now all of a sudden you're not living like a Jew, but now you're wanting the Gentiles to try to live like a Jew? Why? What's the manner of this hypocrisy that's coming from you, Peter? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Now the Apostle Paul wasn't saying that they weren't sinners. What he was saying was that the, the Jewish religion was separated. Before Christ came, the Jews, because of their covenant with God through the sacrificial system, they were accepted of God. They were not sinners like the Gentiles, although that they were really truly sinners, but because of their faith, if they expressed 
proper faith in the sacrifice which represented who Christ is and what He would come to do at Calvary's cross, God would no longer see them as sinners, but He'd see them as righteous. The same thing goes with you and I now, that when we become born again and we begin to look upon the sacrifice of who Christ is and what He accomplished for us at Calvary's cross, we're no more sinners like the world. That's one of the things that bothers me most when Christians say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner saved by grace, but now you're a born again child of God. I'm not saying that you never sin, but you're not a sinner. There's a difference. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying right here. We who are Jews by nature, in other words, we're, we're born into this Jewish, this Jewish religion, and not sinners of the Gentiles. Now, what we're fixing to look at and what we're fixing to get to is the foundation of all Christianity, of true Christianity. This is the bedrock. This is the foundation. This is what you've got to know. This is what you've got to live by. This is what you've got to trust in on a daily basis to live this Christian life properly. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The best the law could ever do from day one, from the day that it was given on, on Mount Sinai to Moses, the best that, a, that the law could ever do was lead someone to Christ. The law in and of itself could never save anyone. It could never make anyone righteous. It could never save them or make them righteous. Do you understand? As a matter of fact, the Word of God tells us that the strength of sin is the law. 1 Corinthians 15 and 56 tells us that, that the law, or law in general, will give power to the sinful nature. You've got to understand that as an individual born after Adam, because of the fall of Adam in the garden, that you have something in you that's called the sinful nature. It's the power of sin. You know, we always say it like this, the best analogy that we ever use, and we use it a million times, is it's the reason that you have to teach children to be good and not be bad. Because they'll naturally lie. They naturally do the wrong thing. They'll naturally tend to try to protect themselves because of the fall. Amen. And if you think that your little baby is so good and he doesn't have sin, like the preacher always says, put two one-year-olds in a playpen together and give them one rubber ducky and watch what happens. It's all about me, 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 what I want. Because of the fall of humanity, mankind has an inclination in his heart to go the wrong direction. We have an inclination to go the wrong way. Yes, some men are worse than others. Yes, some men are better than others. But there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does not need to be born again. There is none who does not need to be saved. It doesn't matter how good they are or how good they aren't. They still must be born again. If you're in here today and you have not been born again by the Spirit of God, you must be born again. It's as simple as that. There's sin in us. And it drives us and it pushes us. And some of us, the truth of the matter is, we've been bound by sin worse than others. Some of us have been driven by sin worse than others. But all of us have been bound by sin whether we know it or we don't know it. What I see throughout life and, and my own life, but even the lives of those around me and the lives of those in this world, there are many people who have come to a place in their lives that they're sick and tired of the life that they've been living. They're sick and tired of it. But in all reality, they can't get away from it. They can't get out of it. They've tried over and over and over again. But each and every time, they seem to find themselves right back in the same place where they was. But not only right back in the same place where they was, because it never, it never goes to where you just go where you were. It always gets worse. 
Sin always gets worse. It gets more powerful. The more we reject the grace of God, the more we reject Christ as Messiah and His power in our lives, He begins to withdraw His hand and He allows the power of sin to control us in a greater degree. Not for the reason of our destruction, but for the reason that it would hopefully turn us to Him. Do you understand that? He wants you to turn to Him. He wants you to be born again. He wants you to allow grace to rule and reign in your heart. Grace is not God just saying, it's okay, live how you want to live. It's all good. No, that's not grace. Grace is God's power working in the life of an individual to give them victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. God's grace can give you victory over over drugs and alcohol, it can give you victory over sickness, disease, but most in all, most of all, he came to give you victory over the powers of sin and darkness that control the lives of individuals. Amen. Matthew 1 and 21, his name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. There have been child molesters interviewed on television that said they, they need not let me out of here because I'll do it again. Murderers who say, I don't know why I desire to do the things that I do. I know they're wrong, but I can't stop. The drug addict bound by drugs knows that he shouldn't or she shouldn't be doing what she's doing. Knows that it's destroying their life. Knows that it's destroying their family. Knowing that it's going to take every breath from them. That eventually it will leave them old and decrepit and dead if they even make it that long. But still can't stop. Still can't stop. Because of the power of sin that grips the heart and life of individuals. It's the power of sin. Peter said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Justification is a legal declaration. Justification is a legal declaration of not guilty. Not guilty. All man is born guilty before God, separated from God because of sin that they're born into. Do you understand that? Because of the fall of Adam in the garden, we're all born guilty. And there's only one way to be made not guilty before God, and that's by Jesus Christ. Peter said that, I mean, Paul said that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. In other words, Peter, why are you compelling these Jews, these Gentiles to live like Jews when us Jews who are not sinners of the Gentiles also realize already that it's not by way of works or by way of law that we can be in right standing with God, but only by faith in who Christ is and what He accomplished at Calvary's cross that we can have a relationship with God. The law could not make you holy then and it cannot make you holy now. You understand that? Good deeds could not make you holy then and it could not make you holy now. Going to church every day could not make you holy then. And it cannot make you holy now. But does that mean that we do not do these things? No. Does that mean that we do not pursue righteous living? No, of course not. If you've been born again and the Spirit of God lives in you, there should be a desire to live right before God. But you've got to understand as a new believer, as a Christian, and even as an old believer, that you never put your faith and your trust in your do's or your don'ts. Do you understand that? You put your faith and your trust in who Christ is and what He accomplished for you on your behalf because the truth of the matter is that there's going to be a time in this Christian walk when you're going to fail God miserably. You're going to fail Him miserably it's going to make you sick to your stomach. It's going to make you ashamed. And it's going to make you embarrassed. And it's at those times that you need to know that it's by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You, it's at those times when you find yourself in failure that you've got to know that Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner. Hallelujah. 
It's at those times when you feel guilty, when you feel like you've failed God and you shouldn't stand before Him, that you must realize that you can't stand before Him anyway except for the grace of God. Amen. He didn't save you because you was good. Hallelujah. He saved you because you wasn't. He didn't save you because you wasn't sick. He saved you because of the fact that you was. Amen. You've got to understand that. You've got to realize that. You've got to recognize that. I remember not too long after I gave my heart to the Lord some several years ago, this last time that since I've been holding on because the message of the cross has held on to me, because the gospel has held on to me. That's in the end, that's what it that's what it boils down to. Amen. If you understand the true gospel and you put your faith in the true gospel, the true gospel will not let you go. You'll have to let it go. But it will not let you go. It'll grip to your heart and it'll begin to bring life into you. Amen. But the enemy used to always come at me. Telling me that I wasn't worthy. I wasn't worthy. And one day the Lord spoke to me as plain as day. And He said, none of you are worthy. None of you are worthy. But take it anyway. The gift that I've given you, take it anyway. Not because you're worthy, but because I've made you worthy. I've made you righteous. I've made you acceptable in my eyes. Amen. And that's the glorious good news of the gospel. It doesn't matter how much you felt God or how good you was or wasn't. Amen. But the grace of God has come to bring salvation to all men who would believe. But when the true grace of God gets a hold of your heart, it will begin to change you. It will begin to do a work in you. Amen. No flesh shall be justified by the works of the law. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is, there, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Now to understand verse 17, you've got to understand, you've got to see verse 18. He says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now to understand these two verses, you've got to understand what's going on, exactly what we just talked about. The, the Apostle Peter was being kind of hypocritical. He was, when, when the Jews came down, he was separating himself from the Gentiles. He was going back to the law, is what was taking place. And, and Paul tells him, that's wrong, you can't be doing that. You already know that it's by Christ that you're justified, us Jews. So why are you trying to make the Gentiles live like Jews when it's not those things that makes us justified? Stop doing that. That's not right. Then he tells Peter, If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin. In other words, Peter, you're seeking to be justified by Christ, but you're going back to the old laws, and all those old laws can do is call you a sinner. All they can do is call you what you are, guilty. If you seek to be justified by Christ, but yet you're found a sinner, is Christ guilty? Is He the minister of sin? God forbid. If I build those things back to myself, if I bring myself back under the things that I used to be under, that called me guilty, that made me a sinner, it's not Christ that's making me a sinner, for I built those things unto myself. Now, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the law, he's dealing with circumcision, he's dealing with the feast, he's dealing with all these things. You and I, we've got to bring that into our life. We've got to understand that in our life. One of the biggest misconceptions about Christianity that we've all been taught, or the majority of us uh, growing up, is that, okay, you got saved, God did His part, now you do yours and do good stuff and do good deeds and be good, be a better person, act right, don't sin, don't do this, don't do that, do this and do that, do this and do that, rules and regulations. And we've been taught that those are the things that keep God happy with us, as long as we do good and don't do bad. Now there's some truth to that, that as a born-again Christian, we should live a life that's pleasing to God, right? But what we've got to do and under, what we've got to understand is that it's not those things that make us acceptable and righteous before God on a daily basis. And when we look at our performance, this is a big problem with most of Christianity, that we become performance-based. Our faith, 
Our trust is moved off of who Christ is and what He accomplished for us at Calvary's cross and it's placed into our performance, how good we do or how good we don't do. And what happens when that takes place, when you are doing really well as a Christian and you're doing, listen man, you're doing good while you're on the street. I'm talking about you've been reading the Bible for about a month. Man, you ain't cussed nobody out. You ain't been mean. You've been doing real good. And you start to think, man, I, man, this is good. I'm, I'm doing good. All of a sudden, what happens is your focus has been switched. All of a sudden, you've stopped looking at what Christ had done on your behalf. And you started to look at what you've done for Him. Your faith has been switched. It's been removed. That's one of the biggest problems I've seen with most Christians. They start off, they get saved. They got saved by grace through faith. They realized they was a sinner, that they was a wretch, and they needed to be saved. The Holy Spirit flooded in. He cleansed them and He washed them. They was all so happy, had a big smile from ear to ear. They couldn't even say the name of Jesus without beginning to cry and weep over what He'd done for them. That's how I was when I first got saved. I'm talking about if somebody even mentioned something that sounded like Jesus I began to weep and cry like a little baby couldn't help it uncontrollably it didn't matter who was around all I could do when I heard that name was think about how lost and undone that I was and how that he reached down and he saved me and he washed me and he cleansed me and made me whole not of any works that I've done but only because I realized that how lost and messed up that I was but ha what happens somewhere down the line is we stop focusing on how good He is and how lost we was and we start focusing on how good I am now and how good I need to be for Him. And that brings about miserable Christianity. And eventually it brings about failure. It brings about failure because you begin to put your faith in yourself. Your trust in yourself and no longer is your faith in who Christ is and what he accomplished for you are y'all understanding what I'm saying that's that's a serious thing and we'll see why let's let's be, keep reading he said for I through the law am dead for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God I'm gonna jump over real quick see this is learning how to surrender to the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not attempting to be accepted of God on, on your own merit or what you're doing by what you've done or anything that you're doing, but only trusting in the righteousness of Christ that was given to you by God. Philippians chapter 3, real quick, I want to read these verses. I knew that was the wrong one. Philippians 3, and verse 7. He said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. See, righteousness is a gift from God. Righteousness is a gift that comes from God through Christ. Because it's only the righteousness of Christ that's acceptable in the eyes of God. The book of Romans in chapter 5 tells us that grace works through righteousness. Grace can work in the life of a sinner only through righteousness. We've got to understand that. That's important to understand. We understand that each and every one of us were born unrighteous sinners before God. We had no claim to anything that God has in and of ourselves. And we need the grace of God to give us victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's why we preach against AA here. Because it's not AA that will give you victory over alcohol, but it's God's grace that will give you victory 
over alcohol. And this is the truth of the matter. And you might not agree with me and most people might not agree with me. But the fact of the matter is I don't really care. Because I know what I'm saying to be biblical and to be true. God would rather a person be bound by alcohol and drugs and that it would lead them to salvation in Him than He would that they would go to AA and quit drinking and never get saved. God's not in this thing for people to have just a good life on earth. He came to save sinners from sin. He came to save sinners from sin. And unfortunately for you and I, the fact of the matter is, is that we're a bunch of big knuckleheads 99% of the time. And it takes us really going to a bad place before we get sick and tired of being sick and tired. It takes us really going through a whole lot of stupidity, a whole lot of foolishness, a whole lot of idiocy, before we realize that we have a real serious problem. Oh, it's not, it's not a, uh, they, they call it a disease now. Al alcohol is a disease. Drugs is a, drug addiction is a disease. No, it's sin. It's the power of sin ruling and reigning on the hearts and lives of people. And the only disease that they have is that they're sin sick. And they need the blood of Jesus Christ to wash them and cleanse them. And they need the power of the Holy Spirit to give them God's grace. We need to learn to surrender to the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, Christian. You will find yourself battling constantly over trusting in your own righteousness and trusting in the provision that God has given us in Christ. This is a daily battle. This is not something that happens every now and then. This is a daily battle. You will find yourself being tempted to trust in yourself. Either you're good or you're not so good. And what happens at first, it'll be good that you'll be trusted in. And then what will happen is when you're performance based, your good will turn to more and more bad. Because God's grace will be frustrated like we're fixing to see when we go back to the book of Galatians. I hope I'm not boring you, but I'm really trying to, to get you to understand how serious and important this is, what we're talking about. This is a matter, This what we're talking about, you've got to understand, is a matter of Christian life or death. It's how serious it is. It's a matter of spiritual life and death, what I'm telling to you. More Christians have died spiritually because of the fact that they were living a performance-based Christianity than anything else. A performance-based Christianity will leave you lost. He said, For I through the law am dead through the law that I might live unto Christ. In other words, in Christ I died to the law. I'm set free from the power of the law over my life so that now I can live unto God and not be bound by law. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians, once again, Romans chapter 5, I believe it's verse 20 and 21, tells us that grace reigns in the hearts and lives of people through righteousness. Grace, God's power, the moving and operating of His Holy Spirit reigns as a king over people's hearts. Listen, you're, you're either being reigned in your heart by one of two things. Either sin has dominion over your heart or God's grace has dominion over your heart. There's no in-between. That's what Romans tells us in Romans chapter 5. That whereas sin reigned unto death... Now that through righteousness, grace might reign unto life. 
But it's only through righteousness. And that's why we've got to learn to live by the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. The righteousness that He's given us. See, a lot of people talk about faith, faith, faith. And we talk about this all the time. But we got to understand that the majority of people who say, Oh, you got to have by faith. Oh, you got to live by faith. You got to have faith. It's faith. You got to have faith, 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 faith. I see it all the time. Everybody says, Oh, you just got to have faith. The saints, you got to have faith, the saints. You got to have faith. Hey, sorry anyway, you might well not have faith in them. But even when they are good, they still can't save you. Everything you do in life takes some kind of faith. When you drive over the intercoastal bridge, you got to have faith that it ain't going to fall. When you sit down in a chair, you got to have faith. That it ain't gonna fall. When you get in your car and you go to drive up somewhere else, you gotta have faith that your car ain't gonna break down on you. So it's not just faith, but it's a right faith. It is a proper faith. What I found with most Christians is that they have placed their faith in faith. They've placed their faith in faith. They think if you just say faith, 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 and you act like you got faith that it's going to be alright, but that's not the faith that is accepted by God. There's only one faith that God accepts. There's only one faith. And it's faith in who Christ is and what He accomplished at the cross on your behalf. When you as an individual learn how to trust in. Listen, I'm talking about unwavering. Man, you go about two weeks and you're doing good. Reading your Bible every day. Wednesday you at church. Sunday morning you at church. Sunday night you at church. Man, you just can't wait to get to church. I mean, you even come in 30 minutes early for church just because you're so excited to get there. Right? But when you're learning to truly live by faith, your faith is not in those things. Regardless of what you've done good, you've learned to continually trust in who Christ is and what He did for you at the cross. And then guess what? Tomorrow when you wake up and you do a big piece of stupid, like the preacher always says, and you get mad at your husband, you get mad at your wife, you talk to your co-worker like you shouldn't talk to her, you know, somebody doesn't cut you off uh, at the red light over there and you just really want to pull over and beat the daylights out of them. When your faith is in Christ and who He is, who He is and what He's done, when you're learning to truly live by faith, you see those things with your eyes. And what happens is, you don't look at those things and say, oh, I've got to do this now. I've got to do that. I've got to do penance. Basically is what it is, so God will be happy with me. See, a lot of times that's what we do. When we do something bad, we try to do something good to make up for it. And we think, okay, I, man, I just, I, I, I got to be better. I got to do this. I got to do. In and of itself, it's not a wrong thing. But that's something that you cannot offer up to God. God does not accept those things as a payment for your sin. He does not accept those things as a payment for the wrongdoing that you've done. And what happens is when you begin to do those things and trust in those things because you feel like you failed God, once again, your faith has been shifted from who Christ is and what He did for you at Calvary's cross and it's been placed upon yourself and performance based faith <laughs> equals performance based death. You will eventually die when your faith is in anything other than who Christ is and what He accomplished for you on your behalf. I don't care what you did yesterday. It wasn't you that saved you. It was Jesus and His shed blood that saved you. So get up. Shake the dust off of your shoulders. Shake the dust off of your face. Uh, yes, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord. I failed you. But I know it's the blood of Jesus that saved me. It's not me. And I'm not looking to me for my righteousness, Lord. But I'm looking to you. Amen. I'm looking to you, Lord. You're my provider. You're my savior. You're my strong tower. You're my comforter. You're my rock. It's not a preacher or a ministry. It's not my do's and my don'ts, but it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that can keep me righteous in your sight, Lord. Teach me to walk by faith. 
And let me tell you what happens when you want to learn to walk by faith. What happens is you begin to get tested. And you begin to get put through the fire. You begin to get all burnt up. Why? So that in the midst of the burning, you can learn to look to Jesus and not yourself. That you can learn to look to the blood and not your failures or your what you think is victories. A lot of Christians, unfortunately, have frustrated the grace of God. And one of the biggest mistakes that we see is that we get to a place to where we think that God owes us something because we did good for a little while. Yes. Well, well, I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. And then all of a sudden, everything starts falling apart. And then we get mad at God and say, well, I've been doing good, God. Why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing? And God's sitting up there saying, I never did anything for you because you did good. I never did good stuff for you or gave you grace because you was good. I gave you grace because you knelt at my cross. I gave you grace because you realized that you were in need of grace. I gave you grace because you realized that you were lost and separated from me and that I loved you and sent my son to save you. That's That's why I gave you what I gave you. Now come back to your first love. Look away from whatever it is that you're looking to and come back to Jesus. That's what we as Christians have to learn to do on a daily basis. That's what it means to take up your cross. That's what it means to take up your cross. It doesn't mean that you've got to live bound by some sin all your life and you call that your cross. No, 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 no. Taking up your cross means that you have victory over that garbage through the cross that you were crucified on with Christ. You've got to understand your identification with Christ and what it brings you. But unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of preachers out there, and I'm just going to go ahead and call names in case that people get confused, but there's people like Joseph Prince and and some of these other clowns, Creflo Dollar, they preach this, this grace message that is this close to the truth. They preach an identification with Christ and the benefits that come with Christ through His cross. They preach those things, but they do not teach you about the pain of the cross. You've got to understand that the cross is a painful process. The cross didn't feel good for Jesus. And let me tell you something, the cross is not going to feel good for you. The cross ain't about Mercedes. And, and Rolls Royces and two-story houses. The cross ain't about you getting a jet plane so you can fly all over the place. The cross is about you dying to the power of sin. The cross is about you learning to live in victory. Now there's some benefits of the cross. There's victory in the cross. There's cleansing and freedom from sin in the cross. Yes, your bills can get paid in the cross because Jesus is your provider. Amen. Jehovah Jireh. He'll provide for you and I. He provided a sacrifice, but He'll also provide for us. That doesn't mean that we'll get rich. That means we'll have our needs met. That means we ain't going to starve to death. That means we'll, we'll have somewhere to lay our head. Oh, it might be underneath a tree, but it'll be all right. He's our shelter. There are benefits in the cross. I don't deny that. But you've got to understand, first and foremost, if you want the benefits of the cross, you've got to embrace the death of the cross. You've got to embrace the pain that comes with the cross, the dying. And I want to go back to verse 20. The apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now that was the first half of my message and I'm fixing to preach the second half. So y'all bear with me. We don't have church tonight and it'll be alright. I want to go to the book of Romans chapter 6 and show you what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ 
were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now we're going to come back to that in a minute, because I want to show you how that that's not water. That's not talking about water baptism. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin any longer. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He that is dead is freed from the sinful nature, is what that could say right there, because in the Greek, there's a definite article there, and if it was translated properly into English, it would say, for he that is dead is freed from the sin or the sinful nature. So what it's saying is that you're not free from an act of sin, but you're free from the power of sin that controls your life. You're free from that. But it's important to understand how it is that you're free from that. Just a couple of verses back, the Apostle Paul says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into His death. This is clearly speaking of the cross. It's not speaking of being baptized into water. There are religions out there that say that you have to be baptized into water to be saved. But that's false. It's not true. And, and you might say, oh, well, what's the big danger of that? Well, here's the big danger. When you believe that you have to get baptized to be saved, your faith is not in Jesus and what He did, but your faith is in being baptized in water. That's the problem with that. So it's an improper faith. You go around trusting in whether you got baptized or not. A lot of people think because whenever they was a kid they got baptized, they're saved. I'm here to tell you, that's not what saved you. If that's the only thing that ever happened to you that makes you think you saved, you better get on your knees and ask God to be born again. Because it's not water baptism that saves you. It's only baptism into Christ. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. God's plan of salvation. Baptism, baptized means to be immersed. It means to be immersed. And what the Apostle Paul is saying here, that know ye not that so many of us as were immersed into Jesus Christ, were immersed into His death. This is salvation, God's plan of salvation for all of humanity. The book of Romans tells us that through one man, sin entered into the world, that man being Adam. We're all related, whether we're black, white, yellow, pink, I don't care what color you are, we all came from the same man, his name was Adam. And we all came from him with sin in us because of the original sin that he committed. So sin entered into one man. We're all born sinners because of sin from our father Adam. But when you and I reach a place to where we realize that we're lost, we're undone and we need to be saved. And that usually happens, like I said, from the midst of a bunch of idiocy that takes place in the course of our lives that leads us to the final notion that we realize that we're a sinner and we need to get saved. Unfortunately, that's just how it goes for the majority of people. They go through a whole bunch of stupidity and mess and they finally realize that they are, they're undone. They're lost. They need to be saved. That's why Jesus... That's why Jesus said, I didn't come for the, for the uh, righteous, but I came for the unrighteous. Because it's the unrighteous that realize they need to be saved. He said, the healthy don't go to a doctor. It's the sick that need a doctor. Only those that realize they're sick. So you come to the place, you realize that you're sick, that you're lost, that you're full of sin. You need to be saved. And then you come to the cross where Jesus died for you. And you ask God to forgive you. You ask Him to save you from your sin. What happens, spiritually speaking, I wish I had a board out here, I would draw a picture. We have one circle over here called Adam. We have one circle over here called Christ. And when God looks at humanity, He only sees them in one of two places. They're either in Adam or they're in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? He doesn't see whether you're in the Baptist church or the, the, the Catholic church or this church or that church. No, He sees you either you're in Adam or you're in Christ. That's how He sees you. Because what happens is 
The moment that you come to salvation, God the Holy Spirit takes you and He removes you from Adam and He, spiritually speaking, hides you in Christ. This is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual birth. We'll see that in a minute. Am I losing y'all? Am I going too long? Y'all good? I want, I want to get this point across. He takes you from Adam and He hides you in Christ. And He does this in the death of Christ. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. This is God's plan. You were dead and separated from God in Adam, but you were alive. So He takes you and kills you in Christ so that you can live in newness of life. God's plan. That's a good plan. See, a, a regular man couldn't have made this plan up. Any religion, even most of Christianity, ultimately somehow comes back to what you and I have to do. But God's religion is all based on what He did and what He does in individuals. So He hides us in Christ. He immerses us. He places us in Christ at the cross. Amen. You know what the cross is? Oh man, this is getting good. This is good stuff. The cross in the Old Testament was always represented by the altar. When the lambs or the oxen were killed, they were all killed on the altar. Right? That's where they were killed, at the altar. The cross is the ultimate altar. The cross is where the last sacrifice was offered up. Right? So you and I, we become one with Christ at the cross. We become one with Christ on the altar. When men and women get married, where do they get married at? The altar. They make their way to the altar and they become one flesh. Marriage between a man and a woman is, 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 is sanctimonious. Do you understand that? It's holy in the eyes of God because it represents... It's a physical picture of the spiritual bride of Christ becoming one with Him. Man didn't make marriage up. God did. When a man and a woman comes together, the Word of God says they become one flesh. Well, that's what happens when you become the bride of Christ. You and Him become one flesh. He's now your provider. You're one with Him. God no longer sees you. He sees Christ because Christ is the head of the household. He's the head. We're in Him. We're hidden in Christ. We've been immersed in Him, placed into Him, hidden in Christ. He's our husbandman. That's why the Word of God calls us the bride of Christ. His church is the bride of Christ. That's good stuff. We're one with Him. He says that, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. So we were placed in Him at His death. And then that means we were buried with Him by baptism into death. Not only were we hidden in Him, but we were taken into the tomb with Him and buried. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now this is talking about today. Walking in newness of life today, empowered by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Ghost. Church, what you've got to understand is your faith, your trust must ever be in who Christ is and what He accomplished for you on your behalf. First of all, you've got to know that you've been born again. Not by water or anything else. You've got to know that you've been born again. If you've been born again, then you're hidden in Christ and you're one with Him. I want you to understand this, like I said, this born again experience is not talking about water. And we know that for several reasons. Number one is because water is not mentioned in this verse period at all. There's no talk about water. Number two, if we was to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. That's the second reason why we know that it's not talking about water baptism. 
Because let me tell you something, if you had to be baptized in water to be saved, and the Apostle Paul was not preaching water baptism, then the Apostle Paul wasn't sent by God. Amen. If you've got to be saved. The Apostle said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Because it's the gospel that saves, amen? Your identity is in Christ. Last but not least, and I'm fixing to close, and everybody said amen to that. Amen. John chapter 3. If I can find it. John chapter 3. We're going to look at this little story about Nicodemus real quick. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a good or a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto thee, unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't say, Except a man be baptized, he cannot see the kingdom of God. No, he said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But then there's a little controversy that comes up. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water. And the church of Christ people said, See, I told you, you got to be baptized. But that's not what it's talking about. And we'll show you why. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That, once again, is not speaking of water baptism. And this is how we know that, because the next verse says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The water that's being talked about right there is when a child is born, his mother's water breaks. A child, any human child that's born, is living inside of a sack in their mother in a thing of water. Or whatever it's called. And that's what Jesus said. Only man can be born again. He said, what's of the flesh is of the flesh. In other words, what comes forth of the flesh that breaks forth out of the mother's womb must be born of water. You must be a person to get saved. Angels can't get saved. Dogs can't get saved. Gorillas can't get saved. None of that stuff. Uh, kittens can't get saved. Lions can't get saved. None of that. It doesn't work like that. But only humanity can be saved. You must be born of the water and you must be born of the Spirit. You must be born one time as a human and then you must be born of the Spirit of God. That's what he says. What's of the flesh is of the flesh. Born of water is of the flesh. Born of the Spirit is of God. You must be immersed into Christ at His death. You must be born again. You must have the Spirit of God breathe life into you and have your spiritual eyes open. Church, the foundation of the gospel is who Christ is and what He accomplished for you. There's nothing that you can build upon that that will not fall away if it's not tied into that. You've got to understand that first of all, God does not owe you anything because you were good. And you've also got to understand that everything you have in Christ doesn't fall away or is taken away from you because you messed up. Do you understand that? It's not because you was good and it's not because you messed up. Amen. It's because of your identity in Christ. It's because of you being in Christ. Oh, preacher, you're saying I can live how I want. Listen, if that's how you feel about this Christianity, you got a bigger problem. you got a bigger problem than, than I can probably help you with. Because when the Spirit of God is living in you, Yes, you might be struggling with sin at times. But deep down inside of you, there's something that wants to live a holy and righteous life that's pleasing to God. Any church, for, let's get something straight. Any preacher that stands up behind the pulpit and basically says, oh, you can live, live how you want and it's all good. You're saved. You've been once saved, always saved. You got baptized. It's all good. They're not preaching the gospel. Because the gospel doesn't say that you can live in sin all you want. It doesn't say that. But the gospel also doesn't say that you have to have victory over sin in and of yourself. The gospel is victory over sin. The gospel is not freedom to live in sin, but it's freedom to pursue a life that walks above the power of sin. We have the right 
church as born again Christians to pursue righteousness, to pursue holiness, to pursue godly living. We have the right to do that because we're free from the bondage of the law. We have the right to do that. It's a privilege to be able to do that. To pursue righteousness, pursue holiness, pursue godly living. And all the while that you're pursuing that, your faith's not in yourself, but it's in the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. So when you come up short, you're not under bondage. You already realize that you wasn't there to begin with. That your righteousness comes from the Lord. He is your righteousness. I want to encourage you today to cling to that solid foundation. That it's all about who Christ is and what He accomplished for you on your behalf. I don't care how you failed the Lord. I don't care how you've struggled with things. Get up. Look to the Lord for your righteousness. Ask Him for forgiveness if you need to be forgiven. Repent if you need to, be, need to repent because He'll forgive you and He'll cleanse you. Live for the Lord and pursue His righteousness. Run after Christ, for He is the righteousness that was given us. Amen? You don't have to be in bondage to sin anymore. You don't have to struggle with sin anymore. And if you're still struggling, hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Christ because there's freedom in the blood of Jesus for you and I. There's victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil in Christ. He is our provider. He is our provision. Amen? Let's stand together. Father, we just come before you today, Lord God. And if there be any in here, Lord God, that struggled before you, Lord, and that's all of us at times, Father, we just come to you today, Lord, and we ask that you'd cleanse us, that you'd wash us by the water of your word, Lord God, by the Holy Spirit that cleanses, that through the blood of Jesus, Lord God, you'd let us see and understand our righteousness that it lieth only in Christ Jesus and His sacrifice at the cross, Lord. Father, we ask that You teach us on a daily basis to continue in the faith, Lord. Lord, that You would cause us to walk up our upright before You, that You teach us how to walk in the faith. Lord, we ask that as individuals You would strengthen our faith, Lord God, and You would help us to keep it focused on Christ, Lord. Father, we cast down all things that come against us, Lord, that come against our families, our children, our loved ones, Lord. Father, we plead the blood of Jesus against the enemy right now, and we ask for safety and protection. But most of all, we ask for salvation in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask by your Spirit, Lord, that you move upon the hearts and lives of individuals. For if your Spirit doesn't move, Lord, then nothing will happen. If your Spirit doesn't convict and convince, Lord, no one will get saved. Lord, if your Spirit doesn't provide the strength that is needed, Lord God, then we'll never be able to live this life that you've called us to live. Lord, we ask that you'd keep us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.